The following is brought to you by Total Seal Piston Rings, the leader in ring seal technology. TotalSeal.com Hello and welcome to another edition of Hidden Horsepower, presented by Total Seal. My name is Joe Costello, WFO Joe, and I am super excited for another edition of this podcast. I know we've had a lot of new listeners reaching out on social media in the new Facebook group, Hidden Horsepower, engine builders and interested folks joining the group and communicating back and forth with everybody at Total Seal Piston Rings. Really cool. My co-host for this episode, he's back, Mr. Lake Speed Jr. Lake, we got a new Facebook group. We got a lot of people out there interested, and we got a very cool episode where we're going to highlight something that is near and dear to your heart and upbringing, talking about small engines and go-karts. Oh, yeah. So we're building off of the, you know, having... Dean Baker from Joe Gibbs Racing Motocross on not long ago. Today we're taking it to a whole new level. One of, um, well, just a, uh, in my opinion, the best of the best. One of the guys who, who's been there, done that, knows it left and right. Uh, so it, it, it's cool to be able to have today's guest on to really say, when you're talking about small engine, single cylinder, getting the most out of what's there you got no other cylinders to lean on you got one (laughs) the one bullet wonder yeah there's nobody better than this guy so i can't wait he's a hall of famer multiple karting halls of fame he is a karting legend he is lynn haddock and he has known you for your entire existence tell us a little bit about the relationship before we bring him on, between your dad, Lake Speed, who went on and won a World Karting Championship, and Lynn, who we're about to hear from. Well, there is no Lake Speed World Champion without Lynn Haddock. I, I know one of the years that we were at the Quincy race, and I'm sure we'll end up talking about it at some point, but TNT Cartway, the Trader family, Quincy, Illinois, is a, just a, <laughs> it's an iconic place, it's a place of significance like a mecca if you will in my life for, for karting remember there being there's a kid we were there for one of the vintage go kart races uh several years ago when they inducted uh dad into the the hall of fame there and dad said that that's not my words that was dad's word that there is no lake speed world champion without lynn haddock and yeah lynn is a guy that has literally known me my whole life it, every once in a while lynn will send me a picture of me when I was like, you know, three or two or six or something like that. I remember one of them, is, they were in Jacksonville, I think, at the um, the race down there, and I'm standing naked in a puddle in the parking lot. Of course, I was probably only two years old, but, you know, it was <laughs> cute back then. So, yeah, I mean, if there's anybody that's got stories on me, it's this guy. Well, let's get to it. He is a Hall of Famer. He's a karting legend. He just heard all that talk up. Let's bring him on the show, Mr. Lynn Haddock. Lynn, welcome to Hidden Horsepower. Glad to be here, guys. Appreciate it. So you just you just heard all of that. I definitely want to hear uh, the story related to Lake's dad. But what I'd really like to know about is Lake's dad before Lake came around. What was that like? Well, I've known Lake since we were teenagers. We first started hanging around together, you know, 17, 18, 19 years old. Of course, I had an old hot rod and he had an old hot rod, but we always managed to to uh, find ourselves either in Barnesville, Georgia, or over in Memphis, Tennessee, racing the go-karts. So Lake and I go back a long, long ways, and, you know, over the years, we uh, we kind of did our own thing, and then when we did this world championship thing, that, that opened up a whole brand new chapter about our karting uh, experiences and also our personal experiences as well. We... Uh, you know, we'd raced together for, I'm going to say, 10, 12, 15 years, and then we decided, you know, we were going to go to try our hand at uh, racing in Europe, and that just that just uh, was like going to get in a fresh, clean sheet of paper, and everything kind of reset and started over. But uh, I've known, like, you know, pretty much most of my life. Very exciting, just the allusion to the European stuff, like, you know, a couple of American boys going over to race carts in Europe sounds awesome. What about 
what Lake uh, Lake Junior. We're going to call you Junior Lake on this episode. Uh, what about what Junior just said in the 1978 World Championship that his dad said it wouldn't have happened if not for you? Before he says, uh, what is your version of that story, Lynn? Well, the way the whole thing went down was Lake decided, you know, he was going to go over and race, you know, in Belgium, actually. And uh, we had both had a lot of success over here, each on our own. You know, we weren't in the same team or anything. We'd just known each other forever and were very good personal friends. But, you know, he kind of did his racing thing and I did mine. Well, you know, a couple months before, he said something about, you know, I'm going to go to Belgium and race. Would you like to go along? I could use some help. And I said, well, yeah, might as well. I've never been out of the country. I'll have to, uh, I'll have to get a passport and do all that. But, yeah, I'd love to go. So off we went. It was myself and, and uh, Lake and his wife, Aurora. And it was just the three of us. And, you know, we put the go-kart in a box and put a few tools in there with it and a couple of spare engines and a few bits and pieces and, off we went on the airplane to Belgium, uh, got us a rental a rental van and went and found wherever we had shipped the stuff to and off we went to the racetrack. And we were green as grass to European style racing. Uh, I'll never forget, we first drove up to the track. We were there fairly early and there was only one guy running. We didn't have a clue who he was. Him and another guy were out there and He'd run a few laps and pull over to the side of the track and stop. They'd always take a wheel off the thing, put it back on. Off they go, run five or six more laps, pull back over and stop again, take another wheel off. And we're probably 100 yards away, so we don't know what the heck they're doing. We thought, obviously, something was wrong with the go-kart. Little did we know, we found out later, they were stopping to adjust the track of the cart because they had you know, bits and pieces on the cart that allowed them to do that. We'd never seen anything like that. Turns out we found out it actually was Francis Goldstein, who this guy was, who was already about a four, three or four time world champion. Him and one other guy were out there all by themselves, just kind of doing their tuning on Monday. So that was our first step into European racing. And of course we heard this thing's direct drive, and it's coming off the corner, you know, ball, real low RPM and going on, and me and Laker looking at each other like, man, these guys ain't going to know what happened when they see our clutches. Uh, a few days later, we were looking at each other like going, yeah, they're not going to know what happened. We're the ones that are not going to know what happened. We were so slow, it was embarrassing. No. But, uh, you know, one thing led to another, and uh, we didn't make the race that year, so obviously we... Two, two badass guys from the United States went over there and came back with our tail between our legs, and we were not only embarrassed, we were now ready to learn more. And that's kind of what started it all in 73, and then we went back every year until 78 when we actually actually won the thing. And Lake wasn't going to go? What was the, the story? Did you have to pressure him, or was it one of those deals where just something else came up, or how did that work out? Well, we had, we had decided, okay, we're going to go back every year. And every year we went back with our notebooks and our bits of knowledge. We had every year made friends, learned uh, a little more. We went with one team for a couple of races and we switched to another team for a couple of races and you know we were just basically putting in time we were always in the top 10 i think he placed in the top five two or three times something like that but came down to uh, 1978 and lake was unfortunately going through a divorce at that time and he said you know lynn i'm not going to be able to go this year and i said well you know that's too bad but i understand the more i got thinking about it the more i thought you know we've we've got five or six years invested in this program I don't know if I'm willing to let it go at this. I think I'm just going to get on the plane and go over there. I knew enough people at that point. I knew I'd, you know, I'd have plenty to do and could talk to plenty of people. And I just thought, well, you know, I'm going to take my notebook like I always do and go so we don't lose a year. And that's kind of how it went down. Well, about a week or ten days before the race was going to be, I was talking to Lake about something else, and I said, well, I'll 
you know, just casually offhand, and said, well, you know, I'll call you when I get back and let you know what, you know, what went down. And he goes, what are you talking about? And I said, the world champs. He said, oh, we're, we're not going. I said, I know, we're not going. I'm going. You're going to go without me. And I said, well, <laughs> yeah, I sure am. And I explained to him why and all. Oh, man. I said, well, okay. So we let it go at that. Well, it wasn't even one day. And he called back and he says, man, you're killing me. I think I'm going to have to go, too. <laughs> <laughs> so he had, he had already canceled all of the hotels because, you know, we usually plan this thing three or four months in advance. Always had rental car, hotel. Always booked uh, what we were going to need from the team that we were working with over there. We actually, several years before that, left our tools and everything over there. So when we got there, we just had to go in the warehouse there on the top shelf and drag our stuff down, get whatever cart we were going to use, throw it in the rental car or rental van or whatever, and away we go. So I just told him, I said, you know, I'm going to go. Well, he had already canceled all the all the uh, arrangements, if you will. So uh, he said, well, we'll just go and take a couple of motors. We'll do the best we can. But he finally got a hold of the Burrell people, and they agreed to bring all the special stuff was all spoken for, but they, you know, they thought that maybe they could find us something. So anyway, we jump on the airplane. All we had was our suitcases. He had a helmet bag, and I wrapped up a little little uh, round uh, uh, leather case of a deal, wrapped it up with a few tools in it. didn't take a lot of tools to work on go-karts back then. And after we got over there, I borrowed a hammer from a guy. And, you know, we used the garbage can for a cart stand. Burrell brought us just a standard production cart, gave it to us. We took a couple of engines with us. The factory agreed to let us have one more so we would have three engines. And that's pretty much how we, uh, how we did it. I mean, we had, uh, we, we had no tires. We were around to everybody we knew over there borrowing, uh, borrowing favors to sell us tires. So when, uh, you know, about the middle of the week, we had a little written over rental car packed full of boxes and tires and this and that. Everything we had was in the back of this little rental car when we moved into our pit area. And, of course, at that time, we went and got the go-kart and started putting all the stuff together. But uh, it was very much a last-minute deal, which generated a, a, a pretty funny story after he did win. I'm down there at the scales after the second main event trying to trying to get to the scales for the crowd to help him get the thing off. And here come Bruno Garana, who was the head of the of the factory that built the engines, IEME, and he's coming through the crowd and this guy's typical Italian. He's a he's about six six, six seven, great big man, had on a big overcoat. He could have he could have starred in the God, in the Godfather. Hmm. It's just the, the, the kind of fella he was. Anyway, he comes down through there, and he, he gets to me, and he says, Haddock, I don't believe it. I spend untold thousands amount of money to come to this world championship, and I get beat by two tourists. <laughs> <laughs> so it, was, uh, it was kind of a gratifying deal, but we just, you know, we did what we, what we did all those years. We got our stuff, and we went off down on the other end where normally the United States, everything was in alphabetical order back then, so Italy was on one end of the of the spectrum, and Unistatis was down on the other end, so we, uh, you know, we just did our own thing, and come time for the main event, so holy crap, these two Americans ain't doing too bad, they're right here with us. So it, uh, it all worked out, all worked out real well. You could say that. It all worked out real well. Lake goes on to beat Ayrton Senna, wins the World Karting Championship, goes on to a great NASCAR career. Uh, Lake Speed Jr. comes around. Amazing stuff, amazing story. And uh, I know we're going to move forward, but i got to say, I really feel that there is the screenplay for a movie in there. Two friends from the United States go to Europe, fish out of water, all kinds of chaos, maybe not going to go, and wins the, wins the championship. Like, to me, that is definitely a movie. We just got to figure out the right person to write this thing, and you guys got yourself a Ford versus Ferrari-style blockbuster, Lynn. Yeah, well, it was, you know, it was, it was an interesting deal because it did take place over so many years. I mean, we... We uh, we went from basically 
getting our asses handed to us and be very, very embarrassed to the very top, top step of the ladder. So it was, uh, you know, it was a, a great story. And, and I got to tell you, everything, everything was a building block. When we got down to the very end, what turned the the thing over in our favor was because we had decided to go at the last minute and all of the special stuff was gone, we didn't have access to the special chassis. We didn't have access to the special tires. And, of course, the tires was a real big deal. We were good friends with the Burrell people, Oscar Sala, and what happened that, that really made the difference for us their number one driver was a fellow by the name of Corrado Fabi. His older brother is Theo Fabi, the one that used to drive the Indy cars. Well, Corrado was their number one driver, and he was a real young guy, real fast, but in the, in the preliminary races, he had a couple of crashes and didn't make the main event. So here he's got all this special tire inventory, and... We ended up getting that stuff because he was out. We couldn't take his special chassis because the chassis were already checked in. You can't change. Couldn't take his engines. That's all checked in. But the tires were free. So when we ended up, I think we ended up starting about fourth or sixth or something like that, we had a real good place starting in the main event, coming through all his preliminary races where he didn't make it. We got his tires. And once we got his tires, then we were pretty much on level playing field with everybody else. We were not going to win. We were probably going to be in the top ten. We were not going to win on just the standard tires that we'd bought from the vendors and whatnot. But once we had access to the special tires, then we, you know, then we felt like, okay, now we at least get to play on a level playing field. And that's what, that's what made the difference. Because if it hadn't been for that incident where he didn't make it and gave us his tire, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been world champs. Amazing. It wouldn't have happened. Amazing stuff. Now, the only thing this story needs is a villain. Not to press this uh, too far, because I do want to bring... <laughs> like, but but was there, like, if it, you know, they'll make us write a villain, like a driver from another team that didn't like you guys because you're Americans or something. Did that exist? It was, was there any rivalry with someone over there? No, absolutely not. All right. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, it was it was quite the other situation because back then everybody that ran up front was connected to one of the factories, if not more. You you had a connection with a chassis factory. You had a connection with someone who could get you better tires than everybody else, or you had a connection with somebody that could get you better motors than everybody else. Everybody over there that ran in the top, I'll say top 20, 25, had some sort of a connection to something. And everybody knew that these two crazy Americans over here didn't have a connection to nothing. I mean, they could, <laughs> you look down there and you could tell we're having to use a garbage can for, for our, uh, our cart stand. So everybody kind of looked at us like, man, you got to give it to these guys. They just won't give up, and they are they are doing more with nothing than everybody else is with, with uh, you know, factory help and whatnot. So we, you know, we, we kind of got along real well with everybody. In fact, I don't recall that we got crossways or had any problems with anybody. And, of course, Lake is a real personable guy. I'm kind of the opposite. I don't, I don't usually, at least back then, I didn't usually have much to say unless somebody spoke to me. But Lake has always been a real outgoing guy, and uh, we've got along real good with everybody. There was there was no villains at all that I know of. That's that's great. A, a great story. We're going to have to write a villain in just because it's Hollywood and all, but we can do it. No big deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Lake Jr., Bring bring it back. Yeah. Like, to me, that's an incredible story, but it, it happened. We know it happened. You're hearing about your dad, and I, you know, I know how proud of your dad you are, but to think like that that happened, 
And then they come back, and obviously the rest is history. We know Lynn went into karting, stayed in karting, Hall of Fame, junior dragster, small engines. We're going to talk piston rings. But here at the start of this episode, my goodness, what an incredible story. What's it like to hear, you know, I know you've heard the story a hundred times, but what's it like to experience that story as Lynn tells it? It never gets old. I still, it gets inspiring. I'm like, I want to go race right now. I can I can smell castor bean oil mixed with <laughs> methanol right now. I can almost hear the crackle of the two cycle engine on the, on the pipe in the back of my head. Cause that's my memory growing up was being in the back of dot dad's, uh, Dodge van cruising all around the country, us going racing with, you know, Lynn and the traders and yeah, the Pruitts and all those people. That's, that's kind of like I said, Barnesville, and um, is a pl- track. You know, remember growing up there as a kid. You know, dad crash in there and things like that. That's. But it was interesting about this story. Besides just that drama of the actual events and the the challenge, the climbing, the striving to to finally break through and get there, is that, like Lynn said, they go over there the best in the U.S. with the best American equipment. And quickly realize that's not going to get the job done. I'd I love to hear Lynn's perspective on this, that today you can go over to, you know, GoPro Motorsports Park in uh, North Carolina, and pretty much every engine on every go-kart is an Yami, an IMAE engine. Well, that's made in Italy. W- what have... And all those chassis are pretty much Italian chassis for the most part. I'd love to hear Lynn's perspective. Does that happen if those guys don't go and don't keep coming back? Like, if you just go once, okay, no big deal. But the fact that those repeated trips year after year, building those relationships, how did that impact what we know as carding today in America? Well... You have to understand one thing. The carding thing supposedly started here, I believe. I believe it started here. It went to Europe. Um, it blossomed in a very different way. Uh, you know, we all kind of started with the same, pretty much the same thing in about mid-50s, late-50s. They developed their stuff a certain way. We developed our stuff a certain way. Their stuff tended more to go with the handling and performance of the chassis. Our stuff tended to go more with the performance of the of the engine package, which included the drive system, the clutch, the exhaust pipe, and whatnot. And it kind of went on that way till the early 70s when we ventured over there and we had the latest and greatest of the evolution of carding over here. And, of course, they had the latest evolution of everything over there, and we kind of rolled out there and went, went uh, head-to-head. It didn't take very long to figure out that if the stopwatch was the determining factor of what was going on, they did it better than we did. Now, were the drivers that much better? No. The equipment was that much better. And the mythology of the way they looked at things was a better a better program than what we had. Um, of course, when we started bringing some of that equipment, which started happening the year after in 1974, we you know I didn't tell you the part about the first year we were there. We did our thing. They did their thing, and we're four and a half seconds off the pace. This, you know, the first time we went in Belgium. Well, Eddie Cheever was one of the ones that we met because he was one of the few there that spoke English. So we met Eddie, and Eddie kept coming over, you know, checking on us. And, you know, you need anything? Because he, you know, he kind of knew we we were operating out of suitcases and boxes that we shipped over there. So he was he was doing the best to uh, make you know, avail himself of if we needed something and didn't know where to go to get it or this and that. He was trying to help us. Because, you know, he'd, he'd been there, done that. You know, he raced over there all the time. Anyway, finally he says, you know, 
why do you guys always work on the motor? Y'all don't ever work on nothing but the motor and the clutch. I don't ever see you do anything to the chassis. Well, that's just how we do it. He said, well, i got to tell you, the problem y'all are having has nothing to do with your power. The problem you got is the chassis. And we're like, oh, no, 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 if we get this work and that work, we'll be okay. Well, anyway, every you know, every two or three hours, we're, we're comparing notes and this and that. And finally, somewhere along in there, Tuesday, Wednesday, something like that, he said, look, y'all ain't getting nowhere. If I bring you over one of my chassis, he said, I got a bunch of them over here that I ain't going to use. I've kind of picked through everything, and I know which ones I'm going to use. Let me bring you a chassis and a set of wheels. You take your tires, your motor, everything, and put it on my chassis and just test it. He said, if you don't like it, that's fine. Just just humor me and test it. And like I said, well, you know, at this point, you know, we've kind of hit the wall here. We've been all day today and ain't going any faster than we were this morning. Here it is in the afternoon. I think we'll take you up on it. So here come a couple of Italian fellows, and they brought us the chassis and some wheels and everything. Well, that you know, that night we put this thing all together, took our uh, took our motor and everything we put on there, and rolled out there the next day. We were two full seconds quicker than we had been the whole time we were there. So we said right then, you know, they got something we ain't got. This precipitated the fact that when we got home, Lake started bringing some equipment from over there, and we started testing over here. Lake and I actually, we would go to Paducah and Memphis and Barnesville and places like that and race against each other to try to raise the level of performance. You know, I'd do what I thought was right, he'd do what he thought was right. We'd race each other, and then we'd compare notes, and then... Next month, we'd come back and do it all again. And this went on for five or six years. I mean, this this this, this embarrassment, this, this ass, ass got handed to us so bad, we weren't going to give up until we at least made some kind of mark on this deal. And so people saw that we were bringing this, you know, foreign equipment. And by then, word had got out of what happened, and everybody's like, well, you know, if, if that stuff's that good, maybe we need to get some of it. So gradually some of this foreign equipment started drifting in over here, and lo and behold, it proved to be, in many cases, better than what was here. And over the course of, what's it been now, another 30 years, the foreign-made equipment has taken over the whole go-kart market over here. Uh, the engines, the only engines we ever had here that were made here, that you know, in any sort of volume or anything, was the McCullough. And in 73, when Black & Decker bought McCullough, they got out of the go-kart engine business. Well, that left a huge void, and that void was filled by engines from Italy, mostly. A few, a few from other countries, but mostly from Italy. And it's just, you know, it's just... It's populated all through the thing for the last 30, 40 years, and now it's pretty much all you ever see is Italian karting equipment over here at the highest levels. And it, and, it, and it all comes back to the fact that, you know, they did it. They did it better than we did. Well, I just want to say that I think you are a reverse Marco Polo and definitely brought that technology back and i agree with what lake's premise was that uh, first of all i find it funny that the american guys are working on the engines right so typical like a like a stereotype like the american <laughs> guys want to make the power they're not really interested in tuning the chassis uh they're interested in making the power but then you take the two together you put it together and you get a wicked combination and it like uh, it seems like that is what happened and when they bring it back that's where things take off Oh, yeah. I was thinking about it the other day. Uh, there's a really great magazine for people who are listening. To the, if, you, if you're listening to the podcast, obviously you're, you know what you're listening to, Hidden Horsepower. There's a magazine called Race Engine Technology that's published uh, by a guy named Ian Bainsey out of the U.K., and he interviewed Dad recently about this kind of history of uh, the evolution, if you will, of the two-cycle racing engine from, like Lynn said, the early McCullough chainsaw motors to the now the modern water-cooled engines, the KA100 uh, from that, that's real popular air-cooled uh, two-cycle engine. And we were 
you know, looking at the the Pistons for a picture for the mag for the story, and there's this old piston port Wiseco piston. It's got the two rings on it, and it's got all the holes in it because the you know a lot of the transfer ports and stuff weren't in the the, the body, you know, in the the sleeve and the cylinder. They were actually you know in the piston. Is how it would it would work. Um, and there's a funny story about that too that I'm sure Lynn could talk about. You know, the third transfer port and where that came about. Um, so here's this old Wiseco piston that's got all these holes in it. Well, then here's this vintage B bomb piston for the Comet engine that has only one ring. It's a Dyke style top ring instead of two rings. There's no holes in it. And that old Dyke style top ring, no holes in the piston, looks a whole lot like the modern piston with the Dyke's top ring on it. But the modern piston's got different coatings and things. So it's funny, like Lynn said, is that they were just better at it <laughs> overall and that those things have left a mark. And that engine technology, that development during that time still has an imprint on the day, which is kind of amazing to think. It absolutely is. Lynn, dive in on that in terms of evolution of technology. We talk about piston rings a lot because of total seal. And I just I can't imagine that the advance of technology, even technologies like piston rings, it, thinking to what Lake just said, like back in the day, it was like this. And here we are. We've evolved all this this time. And some things are similar. Well, the bottom line is. Uh, you keep rubbing on a rock, and the rock just keeps getting shinier and shinier and shinier. Back in the very beginning uh, with the McCulloughs, we always ran two 24,000th rail rings. Then when the, when the Italian stuff came online, everything pretty much had two rings. And that was great from a ceiling standpoint, but not so good from a frictional loss standpoint. Uh, and over the years in Italy, the two-ring stuff pretty much went away to a single ring. They've always had a, a huge fascination on the on the uh, non-gearbox stuff. They've always had a fascination for the dikes type ring. The gearbox stuff has always used a rail-type ring. But um, the big... The big move in the last 20, 25 years has been to not lose any seal, but to reduce the friction. In other words, keep the same seal that they've had all along, but reducing the friction. And they've managed to accomplish that by going thinner and thinner with this top ring and less and less tension. Obviously, the water cooling has helped that because you have less distortion. You don't need as much pressure to keep it sealed up but uh it's it's all been an evolution of one little thing one little thing i'm sure you know even in the junior dragster stuff when we started with it we were running uh much wider rings than we run now and it all goes back to getting rid of the parasitic loss that comes from the drag you know induced by the rings but one thing's for sure, you cannot give up the seal. The seal is first. If you can make it seal with less friction, now you're now you're talking about getting it getting the ball plumb out of the ballpark. And I think that's one of the things that Total Seal has done by making the rings a much higher quality piece. And when I say higher quality, the fit and finish, the rings are nice and flat, they fit the piston. Uh, you know, it's just a much, much higher quality piece, and consequently, this is brought on better seal than you ever had before, and you can do better seal with less pressure. The one thing that uh, people tend to forget about piston rings, everybody always wants to take a look at the ring and, you know, see how the ring is sealing against the cylinder wall. And, and it's true, it has to seal against the cylinder wall. But you can lose just as much compression around the back of that ring and out the bottom 
as you do down the side. So it's it, it, it sometimes you know sometimes you you can't see the forest for the trees. You're so busy looking at one thing, you totally ignore something else that could in fact be just as important. That's a great point, and I've you know we introduced to the open market in the last year these gas ported piston rings and they've been extremely successful in lots of testing you know test i've been involved with you know at ron shavers at joe gibbs and but other people have, have had them and tested them and we were talking with one of the piston company engineers the other day about them and we were kind of scratching our heads as to they okay it's proven that it works but why is it working you know, obviously we know what gas ports are for pistons for you know, redirecting that flow very similar to the uh, that dike style top rings like i said the italians really like in the uh, direct drive carts but one of the things we kind of hit we kind of noticed in talking about it is that when you put that gas port in the ring it's going on the top side of the ring where you're increasing the surface area on the top of the ring so now from a even though this is not hydraulics, but that think about that in that direction, that we have a larger area on top, a smaller area on bottom, so now we've increased the sealing force against the ring groove, just what you're talking about. And maybe, I can't tell you, I don't have any in-cylinder in pressure transducer uh, data to say, well, that's the reason why you're seeing less blow-by with the gas-ported ring than with a gas-ported piston, because that same thing isn't happening. Because that's the real question. Like, you put a gas port of the same volume in a piston, and it does one thing. You put a gas port in the piston ring of the same volume, and it does something else. Why? I can't tell you why. I can come up with theories, and maybe you're, you're talking right there about how much seal you're losing from the back of the ring and underneath the ring. Maybe that's where it's at. I don't know. Well, it probably has it has a lot to do with what's going on down the backside and across the bottom of the ring. I got to tell a, a, a real funny story here that that uh, this goes back probably thirty thirty five years ago. Uh, it was right after well, it was in the it was in the early eighties. That's when it was. Cause it was after Lake had, had decided to get out of the carding deal and go go into stock car deal, and I pretty much took over the Pirelli engine thing from him. So anyway, I go rolling into IME and uh, sat down. You know, you go in and you sat, sit down at the big uh, conference table and all the all the players come in, a little secretary comes in, you know, cafe for everybody, one of them deals. But anyway, so I whip this piston out, set it up on the table, and I peel the, peel the top dock string off of it. Well, it had all this micro-welding. On the bottom of the thing, of course, as soon as it Michael Wells, it starts leaking and runs like crap. So anyway, I brought this over there to complain about the rings. And I said, you know, I don't know what's going on with your rings, but we've got a problem here with Michael Wells. So I set it up on the table, and Garana, the owner of the company, looked at it, and he passed it over to a fellow by the name of Ozzolini, who was an old Italian engineer. He was their, he was their resident engineer. I'm going to guess at the time he was probably 30 years older than I was. So anyway, Ottolini uh, takes his glasses off and lays them down because he's, he's, uh, he's nearsighted, I guess is what you call it. Anyway, and he looks at it, and he looks at it, and he looks at the piston, and he sets it all down, and he goes next door into his office and comes back with a microscope. He sets it up on the table and plugs it in, turns it on. You know, we're all sitting there looking at each other, and he's, you know, he's doing the, doing the big... Uh, check out thing on this ring deal so he gets done he pushes the microscope back pushes the pistons back puts his glasses back on and he turns turns to uh paul condy who was the purchasing agent for yami who was there and he, and he was always there because he was the one that had the best command of english and uh he turns to uh condy and he says something in italian and all of a sudden condy and the secretary and Mr. Garana all start dying laughing. And I'm just sitting there totally baffled. I'm like, what's, what's funny about this? 
So I asked Condi, I said, what's so funny about my problem here? And Condi looked at me and he says, Lynn, do you really want to know? I said, yes, I'd love to know what Mr. Ozzolini said that caused everybody to start laughing. He said, are you sure? And I went, yes, absolutely I'm sure. And he looked at, he looked at Grana and looked at Ozzolini and he says, Mr. Ozzolini would like to know what dumbass lapped his phosphate coating off of the ring and causes it to micro-weld. <laughs> and I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> so I said, uh, that would be me because the ring is not perfectly flat and we have to lap it to make it flat. Well, then we went into the whole explanation about the ring. Maybe it's not perfectly flat, but the piston is soft, and it will conform, and it will seal. But when you take the coating off, you really did screw up. I'll never, <laughs> that, was, that was almost as bad of an embarrassment as the first time we went to Belgium and got shown the way you're supposed to <laughs> race go-karts. <laughs> Oh, wow. I can't wait, Joe. I can't wait for Keith to listen to this one. I'm sure Mr. Jones will appreciate that story. <laughs> yes, no, no, no <laughs> doubt. Great. Well, and we always say, and, and later on, Lynn, not now, but later, we're going to ask you for some advice for the next generation. And it just seems that so much learning, so much ground is covered through making mistakes like that. Like, yeah, you just endured a pretty rough humiliation right there, but... Look where it got you, and you took it, which is awesome. I learned a long time ago. I mean, I, I started this deal, you know, this, this business of working on motors. It all started with the fact that we had a go-kart, but my dad and I didn't really know anything about the motor part of it. We could put air in the tires. We could oil the chain. We could set the tension on the chain. We could do the mechanical stuff about the go-kart. We didn't know anything about the motor. So we had a good friend of ours who took care of the motor. Unfortunately, he also had a stock car. So when the stock car needed work, the go-kart didn't get worked on. Well, one weekend, I forget what was wrong with the motor. The points are out of adjustment or something. Anyway, it was popping and cracking and wouldn't run. And went over to this guy's house and... Uh, he said, well, you know, I've got the motor out of my stock car. I can't, I'm not going to be able to mess with your cart today. I'll try to do it next week, which meant we weren't going to get to race that week. So here I am, 11 years old. Daddy, Daddy, I can fix it. I know what's wrong with it. Just let me try. I can fix it. And Dad said, well, you know, we'll just have to miss this race. You know, we'll race next week. Oh, come on. I can fix it. I know what's wrong. I've watched him before. I, I know what he's going to do. I can do this. So finally, Pop says, well, you know what? It ain't running now. I don't think you're going to hurt it. Go right ahead. Well, I fixed it. It ran better than it ever ran, and that was the last time anybody ever worked on my go-kart, and that started at age 11. And I never was afraid to ask if I didn't know, and I never never uh, was afraid to try something. And like you said, you learn from your mistakes. I hate to think how many cylinders I've ruined with some harebrained idea about some new porting design or this and that, but that's how you learn. Uh, people always ask me when I race junior dragsters, so I used to go to the track a lot, and people always ask me, you know, well, did you learn? did you learn something? I said, yes, I learned a lot today about what not to do. <laughs> Well, let, let's 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 make that transition now, because I find it uh, amazing and great that you can have all of that experience. And then uh, in the 1990s, NHRA realizes like we don't have that for our kids, the gateway, the way for the children and the parents to be involved together. And they innovate the junior drag racing program, which is now responsible for all of the champion race car drivers in the NHRA. And you, with the small engines, and it's, a, it's supposed to be a five-horse Briggs at the very beginning, but of course has evolved now, that attracted you. So talk a little bit about the junior drag racing tie and how it attracted you, and you've had great success. Well, that was another, you know, that was another comedy of errors that happened quite by accident. Uh, I wasn't involved in drag racing, you know, at all. Uh, but a friend of mine came in the shop one day and he says, "Hey, we got to take, 
one of the carts and put a torque converter on it and take it to the drag strip and let your daughter run. They've got a uh, they've got a go kart class. I said a go kart class. He says yeah, they've got a go kart class. So well, okay, we'll talk to the, talk to mom and see what she thinks. So we decided okay, we'll do this. So anyway, we go and we take this go kart out there and we start racing the go kart. And they had a junior dragster class and a go kart class. There's probably 25, 30 junior dragsters, eight or ten go karts. So we started going on Saturdays. Well, somebody, you know, we did pretty good with the go kart. We were we were about a half a second, six, seven tenths of a second slower than the fastest junior dragsters. But you know, we were running a smaller motor and this, that, and the other, uh, much smaller tires. So uh, someone said to my daughter, "Hey, would you like to, you know, like to try our, our junior dragster out?" And he had one of the faster ones there. So she goes over and sits down in this thing, going, "You know, this thing's." All she's ever ridden in her life is a go kart, and she sits down in this twelve foot long thing and took, you know, said, "No, no, no, I don't think so." So that was kind of the end of that. Well, a couple of weeks later, she said, "Hey, you think that guy might uh, still let me drive that thing? I thought about it. I would. I'd like to drive one just one time." So I said, well, "I don't know. Go ask him." So, long story short, he said yes. We start to push the thing up there. Well, all the other families are like, "Hey, wait a minute! You can't turn this girl loose in that fast car. She don't know what she's doing." And I'm like, well, wait a minute. She drives a go-kart, and it's only a half a second faster and certainly a lot harder to drive than the dragster. Well, you know, we're just not comfortable with it. Why don't you let her run after the races are over? Okay, that's fine. Just wanted to, you know, She just wanted to take a spin in it anyway. It's okay with us. So we did. After the races are all over, we push her up there, and the guy told her, you know, showed her how to start it and all this stuff. So anyway, lined her up, bang, down through there she goes. She's a little bitty, little bitty light gal anyway fastest junior pass ever at this racetrack. New track record, the whole deal. First pass. I don't know how much money that one pass cost me in the next five or six years, but it was quite a lot of money. Of course, immediately we had to have a junior dragster. Immediately, like the, I have to say, maybe dum-dum that I am, I wasn't going to just buy one. We had to build one. So a buddy of mine who had built some drag stuff before, we built a jig, and we built our own junior dragster, and, you know, it, it did pretty good, and uh, we started going to a few of the few of the races, but everything we were doing was bracket racing. We didn't know anything about anything but bracket racing, and so one afternoon we're coming home, and my daughter says, Dad, what kind of racing have we got ourselves into here where you let off before the finish line? I said, what do you mean? She said, well, so-and-so, I was talking to him, and he was trying to show me how to do this. He says, you know, you got to let off before you get there. And I go, well, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, anyway, once we raced a little more bracket racing, we started to understand it a little bit better. But then finally we both decided that this was not, you know, this business of, pedaling and uh, running dial in, you know, everything that went with the bracket racing side just didn't go with what we thought it ought to be. So I called uh, uh, this friend of mine who was helping me, you know, with the with the uh, dragster motor. I told him, I said, you know, I think we're going to sell this stuff. Don't want to do it anymore. And told him why. And he goes, well, if you feel that way, you, you need to go, go uh, top gun racing. And I said, well, what's Top Gun racing? He says, oh, that's the, that's the top level of junior drag racing. It's where you run on the pro tree. And he said, it's, it's kind of like top fuel, but it's junior dragsters. And I go, well, I didn't know anything about that. And he says, well, they only run it at the big national races. So I said, well, okay, where do they run? Well, he told me, well, they were going to be one of these races in Cordova, Illinois. Well, I was going to be in um, Norway, Illinois, racing go-karts. So I just went, got in the rental car and snuck over there to nose around and see what it was all about. And, of course, once I saw what it was all about, now I'm all enthused. Came back, told my daughter, well, we went to another race, and she watched and everything. And, uh, so, yeah, let's, we got to do that, we got to do that. And I said, well, you know, you got to remember one thing, though. It's a 16-car qualified field. It's 30-something cars there's a real good chance that we're going to do all this and not going to get to race because them guys know what they're doing. We don't know nothing. My daughter looked at me and she says, well, you think we're going to learn watching them? Wow. And I said, well, <laughs> probably not. That's good. 
Good news. So we we built one of the things over the winter and, of course, went to the first race and didn't make the field, went to the next race, didn't make the field. Every time that happened, it was just like going to Belgium with the go-kart. I just got madder and madder and worked harder and harder. I about wore my buddy Whaley's dyno completely out. I was down there I was every week. The, the motor guy was Roy Whaley, huh? Yeah. Well, yeah. Roy and I are friends. He knew me from karting, and then he got out of karting and got in on the ground floor of the junior dragster deal. As soon as, as soon as I uh, got into the junior dragster deal, I, I gravitated to this guy Whaley, who was supposed to be the best engine guy on the planet. I called him up, and he goes, well, yeah, I know you. Don't you remember blah, blah, blah? And I'm going, well, anyway, so come on down. So I went down to his place. Well, turns out I about wore one of my trucks completely out going back and forth that year because I was going to, you know, I was going to make this dragster at least get on the ladder when we got to race. Long story short, by the end of the year, we won a race. And it all goes back to the original thing. You cannot ever give up. You, you, no matter how hard it seems, you just got to keep persevering and don't be afraid to mess up because that's how you learn. Yep. Lake, jump in here. Oh, I just, yeah, it's, this is the Lynn Haddock passion, right? It's the, it's the I'm going to go, and if you throw that gauntlet down in front of me, you've just, you've asked for your own demise. I remember one of the uh, vintage cart races a couple of years ago we were down at Barnesville when they had the four cycle class in and some guys had been talking some trash and I think Lynn and Roy worked together and they got to put a motor together that was super bad fast and got a bad fast driver and Mike Geeson and they went out there and put the stomp on them so it's just the way it goes it's it's competition it's the it, and correct me if I'm wrong Lynn um your daughter still has the fastest pass in junior or like the outlaw junior dragster history. I understand. No, actually, actually, we only got to do the junior dragster thing for about two or three. No, it was three years, I think. She, you know, we got into it late. She actually turned eighteen and aged out. But uh, when she aged out, another family who we had who had we'd met asked, you know, what would it take to put our daughter in your car? You know, because I was ready to sell out and go on back to go kart racing. And they said, "Well, you know, we'd like to, we'd like for you to let our daughter drive your car." So we worked out a deal. Well, she was in the car three years. Well, by the time she was ready to get out of the car, a couple more people wanted to drive the car. So the the car became a rental ride for the next ten years. I had different oh, people wow, in okay. the car. Uh, actually, had after 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 uh, the girl that came in right after my daughter, I had Buddy Perkinson who. Is a is a, a pretty good drag racer. I think he ran with uh, uh, some of the pro stock stuff for a while. I know, buddy. Uh, yeah, yeah, Cunningham. I think, yeah, I think now he's gone back to pro mod. But yeah, he he was. I think with Buddy, I think we won eleven out of twelve races the next year. Ended up losing one wow. because the brakes went out and he he uh, crawled through the lights one time. But uh, I had I had, a, had a bunch of different people in the car. The record is actually still held by my car, but it was uh, with someone else in the car. That was okay. another one of those deals right in right in that air, right in that time frame there when my daughter quit, and and the uh, uh, the other girl came in. A lot of change was going on within the junior dragster world, not the least of which was going to a piston with the scraper type ring. We had never used that before, and that was just coming online. Uh, got with got with uh, Total Seal to do the ring pack for the size we needed and everything, and that was a huge, huge step forward insofar as the uh, the speed of the junior dragster stuff. I mean, the the record kind of kind of floated between. 430 and 427 right in there for several several years when we got the three ring package where we could seal the motor up and have a whole lot less friction going on then the time started really falling and i think at the 400 pound weight we ended up going like 417 418 something like that it was 
it was almost a full tenth of a second uh, gain over the course of a couple of years there once we got our hands on some, you know, some real good way to seal the motor. But uh, How about that, it was it was just you know it was just like the uh, the European philosophy with the go karts. It was strictly a learning package of you know one step forward, three steps back, but just keep on trying. And yep. as I said, we 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 started we started looking more at this thing from the analytical and physical uh, physics, we'll say, standpoint. Uh, if the motor's not sealed, it's not going to run. It is per- particularly true with the junior dragster motor, more so than the go kart, because the go kart's a two-stroke uh, engine that's got oil in the gas anyway. We always had Dykes ring pistons. Um, it, it, it was just a whole different deal than the single-cylinder four-stroke motor. Um, I've even seen situations where sealing the motor up would actually affect the jetting because the pump became so much more efficient. Uh, it's it's uh, it's the first thing I look at when someone you know someone says, "Hey, will you take a look at my motor?" First thing I do is take the spark plug out and look down in the hole. If it ain't sealed up, you you're wasting your time. Because it just flat will not run if it's not sealed up. After that, you can talk about the, which is the best cam and what size valves and porting and this, that, and the other. But I'm telling you, if it is not sealed, you're wasting your time. And that has been one I remember thing. Remember you telling me, yeah, yeah. It's been one thing that's really helped us going to the the total seal ring pack is just fixing the physics of the whole thing. Yeah. I remember when you were working with Roy, and when I was at Gibbs with the oil deal, you talking about measuring blow-by, even on a single-cylinder engine, that yeah. you had your blow-by meter and sit there and watch the ball, and that's what was telling you, am I sealed up or not? Different oils, different everything, trying to get the least amount of blow-by, because like you said, until you get that short block sealed up, all that stuff you got above it is irrelevant. Yeah, it means nothing. It, it means nothing. I mean, a leaky valve, yeah, that's not good. Uh, porting that's off a little bit, that's not good. Wrong diameter of carburetor, wrong diameter of exhaust pipe, timing set wrong. Yeah, all of those small pieces of the puzzle result in making the pretty picture. But the very first and most important part is that pump has to be efficient, which means it has to be sealed up. I mean, you can you can have the wrong cam in there, you lose a tenth. You have the thing not sealed up, you're going to lose a half a second. It's just it's just something that has to be. I mean, it's kind of like a race car. You go to the track with the race car. One thing you got to have is four tires on that car. <laughs> well, mm-hmm. the motor, the pump. I always call it a pump. But that's all it is. The pump has to be sealed up. I've seen situations where you know you you kind of learn your motors, okay? In the early days when I didn't really realize what was going on with this with this sealing business, once we started sealing some motors up, and we're talking about motors that we knew. We kind of knew for this altitude and this amount of water, it's going to take a 114 or a 115 jet. It's just the way it is. You learn right. you know, from doing it. We started sealing the motors up, and all of a sudden, the jetting is totally changing. We're running much smaller jets and running faster. Well, it had nothing to do with the fact that the motor was running leaner because we were actually burning more fuel. That was that was always, with juniors, one of my big things is how much fuel I could burn. I mean, my, my whole goal in life was to burn one more ounce of fuel on a run. And I could just about look at the gas tank and tell you what the car ran before I even saw the time slip. But once we started getting the motors sealed up, we were using more fuel out of the gas tank with smaller jets, simply because we had made the pump more efficient. 
Amazing. Wow. Amazing. Well, and that's what Hidden Horsepower is all about and why people subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud. Go to the new TotalSeal.com website. They're joining the Facebook group Hidden Horsepower for these kind of tips, stories, and, and frankly, emphasis on that area because nothing else matters if you don't have the pump sealed up. To me, that's that's religion right there, Lake, for the engine builders out there across motorsport. Anything with an engine, to me, that is a statement that is, is uh, religion for hidden horsepower. If it's not sealed up, nothing else matters. Oh, yeah, I have it's, one, it's I have one the same it. things as they've heard from the pro stock guys, right? <laughs> the very best pro stock engine builders say the same thing. You know, I had a fella kind of argued with me a little bit about, the, you know, I was telling you the story about the, uh, the motor burning more fuel with a smaller jet. I had a fella telling me, you know, that's impossible. I said, well, let me, let me, let me explain it to you in a way that is easy to understand. You take a six-foot-long piece of hose, quarter-inch fuel line, go-kart fuel line. Take a six-foot-long piece of garden hose, out of your uh, out of your yard, stick them both in a bucket of water, stick them both in your mouth, and suck on it. That quarter inch hose is going to run that water up in your mouth real quick. You're going to cave your head in trying to get that half inch hose to get the water up. It works the same way when the pump is efficient. It sucks on the carburetor better, so you can actually pass more air and fuel with the same size piston because there's no waste. Your, you know, your piston moves down, in my case, six cubic inches. You displace six cubic inches of air, all of it, whereas if the thing's not sealed up, your six cubic inches of air became five and a half cubic inches of air. So you just cannot have any leakage. It's just that simple. The better it's sealed up, half your battle is won. And there you have it. Lynn, at the end of each episode of Hidden Horsepower, I like to ask our uh, celebrity engine builder, in this case Hall of Famer, uh, some advice for the next generation. We've got all kinds of people out there around the world listening to this podcast to pick up tips, and you've certainly put a lot out there on this episode. This has been awesome for me. But what would you say to those folks out there, uh, you know, think – about the you know the kid he's he's in his teens he's mechanical he's thinking about a career he's thinking he wants to be involved he doesn't know what to do what direction how to uh, make his dream real what advice would you give that person well first thing i learned is you can never cheat the laws of physics okay so always keep that in mind and the second thing is don't be afraid to make a mistake because every time you make a mistake, you learned something. As I said, people always ask me when I went testing, what did I learn? Well, I might have learned one thing to go faster, but I learned six things to do to go slower. Those are the things that you, you must retain. And when you make a mistake and it costs you early out of a race or costs you money because that cylinder is no good and you throw it in the trash, those are the best lessons they're also the lessons that you will retain on and on and on. I'm 70 years old, and I still remember making mistakes as a teenager with a grinder in my hand. Uh, but you cannot be afraid to make mistakes. And the last thing is, if you're lazy, forget about it. You've got to not be afraid to work and work hard. Excellent. And I agree. Lake, you got a final thought or a final question for Lynn? Uh, no, I just, I, every time I've ever had a conversation with Lynn, I've walked away a little bit smarter and today is no exception. Thank you, Lynn, for coming on. I agree. I agree. Well, I certainly appreciate you guys, uh, having me. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, Lynn, this was a great episode, inspiring in many ways and uh, just thrilled to hear the story. I'm going to start working on the screenplay. If I have any questions, I'll just call you. And uh, amazing stories from Lynn Haddock. Lynn, thank you so much for joining us on Hidden Horsepower. Got a lot of information to digest. It was great. The good news is 
we can always have you back again because you got a great relationship with Lake. But hey, before I before I let you go, you know, you've known this guy for a long time, Lynn. You got a story about Lake Speed Jr. want to drop on everybody like a quickie? Just, you know, Lake doing, I always like to embarrass him a little bit just for fun, for my own humor. Is there a Lake yeah. Speed Jr. story that you happen to have ready? Sorry, Lake. Yeah, I've got one that, uh, again, I've, I've, you learn from your mistakes. I rolled into the SEMA show. I think it was, uh, it's been a good 15, 15, 16 years ago. I roll over to the Joe Gibbs area, and uh, I said, his chamber's here. guy looked at me, and he says, who? I said, Chambers. Who's Chambers? I said, Chambers Speed. He, he's, you know, he's one of your guys. He goes, we've got a Speed. We don't have a Chambers. I goes, what? He goes, yeah, Lake Speed. I go, he don't go by Chambers? He goes, who's Chambers? <laughs> <laughs> When I was when I was traipsing up and down the road with Mama and Daddy and and Lake, Lake Speed Junior was Chamber Speed. What? I never knew him. I never knew him as Lake Speed Junior. Chambers. I knew him as Chambers. Chambers. Is that your real name, Lake? He's giving away my alias. Oh, that's, that's my middle name. So my dad is Lake <laughs> Chambers Speed. I'm Lake Chambers Speed Junior. And as Lynn said, from uh, probably very early on, earliest days, Dad was Lake, I was Chambers, and that's the way it was until I was in uh, high school. And then I, somewhere in high school, it's kind of, you know, Chambers is the name of the butler. That's not like Lake's a cool name. Chambers is kind of a lame name. Uh, call me Lake. I'm, I moved around a lot as a kid, too, so it's like you, you learn a couple of lessons, and it's like, oh, I go by Lake, so... That's one of the ways I know how someone knows me. If you kn- know me from carding early on of my life, you you know me as Chambers. Like all my cousins, I'm Chambers. Uh, if you know me from the 90s, early 2000s NASCAR, you know me as Junior. Because Dad was still racing then and I worked in the industry, so I was Junior. Then, if you've known me per, only professionally since probably 2005, you know me as Lake. So, yeah, Lynn gave away my, my alias on that. So, like Starbucks, all that stuff, you use Chambers every once in a while just for fun, just because people can't spell Lake uh, hardly ever. So, anyway, there you go. That's Love it. One. No, listen, Lynn, that was perfect. Uh, you know, I'm fortunate. <laughs> listen, I'm really proud that I get to do this show, and I am fortunate to be able to co-host with Keith Jones and Chambers here is great at it and so I'm going to get some mileage out of this as well and that's really what it's all about that's the reason I'm here thank you so much (laughs) thank you so much for joining us on Hidden Horsepower Lynn really appreciate it you did a great job thank you for having me there he goes Lynn Haddock with us here on Hidden Horsepower Lake, I'm not going to call you Chambers, I promise. But I love that he, <laughs> I love that he zinged you a little bit. You know, that's my uh, that's my style. I like to just kind of extract. But really, what a wealth of knowledge! Like we're all interested in go karts at some level because we all love racing go karts as kids and young men, and even now. And to hear the story of Lynn and your dad just deciding to go, there's a lesson in that. And the fact that they were welcomed and helped, that's cool. The result is cool. The junior drag racing stuff, is it, it's all cool. What an episode. Oh, it's epic. And that's why I really wanted to get Lynn on the show. Because I really feel like Lynn is that same caliber engine guy as an Ed Pink, as a Ron Shaver, as a John Cozzi, as a uh, Keith Dorton. I mean, those, he's just in a different niche that people don't know the name universally like those other guys are super famous because you know big car racing's more widely known than than go-karting but he's the same cloth yeah he is he's that same kind of mind as those other guys and yeah I've, i've been fortunate enough to uh to know him my whole life and that he, he would take the phone call and help us out and is fantastic. It was amazing. Again, like I said, no, not blowing any smoke up the skirts. 
I literally learn something new from him every time I talk to him. Yeah. No, it was amazing. And I'm I'm online. Everybody got to understand that Lake is where Lake is, and I'm where I am, and I've got the computer up. And as Lynn is talking, I'm just kind of searching some of the stuff that he's talking about. And so I'm like, man, this is amazing. This is amazing stuff this guy is talking about. Like, this is incredible. And I really believe it could be a film a script of your dad and, and Lynn going over there, and he's the head mechanic. He didn't race because he's kind of a bigger guy and the weight breaks and the categories. But, you know, like Carding Champions website saluting karting champions and the first two names that come up like one and two lake speed lynn haddock it's just awesome what a great episode but now it's also the longest episode ever but totally worth it for those of you out there we have a new hidden horsepower facebook group which is great and for those that are interested which is everybody hidden horsepower swag say what what's up with that lake hidden horsepower t-shirts they are in stock. Uh, our, our man, Matt Hartford, got us hooked up with some brand new, nice, cotton, black, hidden horsepower logo T-shirts. They're available uh, on the website, uh, totalseal.com. Like I said, the Facebook group is is really great. We're, we're sharing all kinds of stuff. I mean, we have some really, really great members, you know, high-end engine guys, passing enthusiasts, the whole gamut. And we're just dropping little things in there, here and there, that we think is, is interesting. So it, it's, it's really cool. It's great to see what's becoming of this movement beyond just the podcast itself. Exactly. But don't get rid of the podcast, okay? Because, uh, you know, oh, no. I like it. The podcast is the core, the foundation. <laughs> Lake, what an episode. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you. For people that are interested, obviously this is not just entertainment. Uh, we want people who are building engines to realize that they, whether it be for a go-kart engine, whether it be for a pro stock engine, that total seal fits the rings. If they're interested, if they want to call Keith Jones, if they need some knowledge, uh, where should they go? What should they do? Uh, TotalSeal.com has got all of our email addresses. It's got the phone numbers. Uh, you can call 623-587-7400. And like you said, whether you're building an industrial engine, a go-kart engine, offshore boat racing engine, if it takes a piston, we can build a ring for it and we can help it become more efficient. Just like uh, Lynn said, we're really good at trying to help people get stuff sealed up we're not just a piston ring company that makes widgets we're guys who get our hands dirty honing blocks and measuring things with profilometers we can help you get that ring seal so if you're trying to get better ring seal give us a call visit the website we'll take care of you because if you're not sealed up nothing else matters lake thank you so much thank you joe appreciate it He's Lake Speed Jr., a.k.a. Chambers. I'm Joe Costello, a.k.a. WFO Joe. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram. I also do the WFO Radio podcast, where we talk drag racing. Really appreciate all you folks out there. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud. That's where you find the show. You can write us a review and join that Facebook group. We'll see you next time on Hidden Horsepower, presented by Total Seal.